Sup, you beautiful bastards. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. Buckle up, make sure you're subscribed because I'm splitting $10,000 across 10 lucky subscribe beautiful bastards this month. I also think it's gonna be one of the last months that I do this because I'm cheap. But yeah, let's just jump into it. No matter where you looked online, there was Try Guys content plastered everywhere, which makes sense. It was one of the biggest stories in the entertainment space this week. We talked about it earlier this week after the Try Guys announced that Ned Fulmer was out after an internal review, Ned apologizing for cheating on his wife with an employee. While a lot of what we've been seeing online are reactions reactions to the news, as well as people looking at old clips and saying, you know, you can kind of tell this and that. One of the biggest questions in the air was, well, what is next for the Try Guys, right? What's what's next for the other three in the, the company? It appears that we will know soon, but not right now. With the Try Guys announcing late last night, the Tripod will be taking a week off and returning next week on October 6th. We wanted to take some time to formulate our thoughts before recording the episode. Thanks for being patient. To which we've seen mixed reactions, some saying you're doing this to milk views, others saying, you know, this makes sense. Personally, I'm of the mindset of, I think it makes sense for them to take the time to, to properly figure out how to address all this. I think one of the worst things you can do is rush a reaction because you might not say things correctly and then th everyone will kind of like pick apart every single thing that you said and create their own narratives. Though, on the other end, if you wait too long, people fill in the blanks themselves, regardless of whatever is definitively true or not. Especially because it's not just a cheating scandal. An employee was involved, so I don't even know what the legal situation for them is right now. But the main thing is that in a week, we'll know more. And then... A lot of people are asking... It is what you think it is. It's a condom. It helps protect the gear. We can't get these mics wet. There's a lot of wind, there's a lot of rain. So we gotta do what we gotta do. And that is put a condom on the microphone. Practicing safe and responsible reporting. You love to see it. Although I guess the idea of being safe and responsible, that that's gonna be different for different people. For example, when it came to Hurricane Ian, uh, to kind of understand this kind of monster, we saw hurricane hunters actually flying a plane straight into Ian yesterday, capturing it on camera. That's a big no for me. Uh, if I need that sort of rush in my life, I will uh, choke myself while I masturbate like a normal human being. <laughs> I don't know if we include that in the show. Sometimes I get too comfortable here. But that Hurricane Hunter saying that out of the six dozen hurricane penetrations he's done in his career, that was the worst one ever. And specifically saying he's never seen so much lightning in an eye. But like we covered yesterday, Ian made landfall battering central Florida. It's now moved off the coast, though winds and rainfall are still affecting the state. But very fortunately, it's now been downgraded to a tropical storm with only around 70 mile per hour sustained winds as of this morning. But forecasters predict that it is headed north, reaching the South Carolina coast on Friday, by which time it is expected to re-upgrade to a hurricane. Moving further inland through the Carolina on Saturday and Sunday and touching parts of Georgia as well. But while we wait to see that happen, Floridians woke up this morning to assess the damage. And with that, you saw the Lee County Sheriff going on Good Morning America giving some chilling remarks on the death toll. While I don't have confirmed numbers, I definitely know the fatalities are, are in the hundreds. With that horrible estimate getting plastered all over headlines this morning, but fortunately it does not appear to be true. With Florida Governor Ron DeSantis clearing the air in a press conference this morning saying hundreds of fatalities have not been confirmed and adding. The number that was put out by Lee was basically an estimate of, hey, these people were calling, the water was rising on their home, they may not have ended up getting through, so we're obviously hoping that they can be rescued at this point. Also noting the teams will be checking on people who may have called 911 during the storm to see if they need any help or if any rescues are necessary, and saying that as far as the actual death toll, he believes that two people died during the storm, though it is unclear whether they're directly storm related. So for us to actually have any confidence in the numbers here, we're going to have to wait for the Florida Emergency Management to issue a statement on injuries and lives lost. But also important to note, Ian wreaked havoc in other ways, with at least 2.6 million people still out of power, according to one tracker. There's also catastrophic flooding, leaving many stranded with videos on social media showing several feet of water bursting through people's doors. Take a quick scroll through TikTok, you just see all sorts of things, like things like boats being in places where boats should not be in an emergency room in Fort Charlotte having its roof torn off of the intensive care unit. There, forcing staff to evacuate patients on ventilators to other floors as water gushed in. In fact, regarding hospitals specifically, a FEMA administrator said that there were nine hospitals that may have to be evacuated. But right now, it is difficult for rescuers to reach people in their homes or public buildings because roads are either submerged or blocked by fallen trees and power lines. With DeSantis saying there's possibly thousands of people stranded. And all of this warranting a declaration from President Biden that the situation in Florida is a major disaster, which opens up the door for federal aid to supplement state, local, and tribal recovery efforts. So for those affected out there, my, my well wishes to you, please be safe out there. And for everyone else, I'm going to put some links in the description if you want to try and help out. And then we don't want Megan the Stallion. We want money. 
though I'm open to both. That is what a ton of people are yelling at Twitch right now, stemming from this whole controversy we've seen from the last week and now new developments. Right, Twitch recently changed how they pay their top creators. If you have a paid subscription on the platform, it's usually split 50-50 between the creator and the platform, but some big creators had premium subscription terms, which landed them a 70-30 split. And while most of those streamers just wanted Twitch to change those terms to give all creators that same split, Twitch was like, sounds good, how about no? And in fact, creators with premium terms will only get the 70-30 split for the first 100 thousand dollars and after that it goes back down to 50 50. though i do want to note this does not kick in until june of next year so also i wouldn't be surprised if we saw even more people switch over to youtube than than we've already been seeing people already pissed about that right kind of just like holding on to that anger and in the middle of all these creators processing their emotions twitch announced some major musical acts to be performing at twitchcon including megan the stallion well i have literally no idea how much it costs to book meg a lot of people just assumed it's not cheap right the general reaction from a lot of people being what the fuck you just talked about having to make it so the creators made less money because what you do costs a lot of money. But instead of making cost-saving measures elsewhere that don't impact your creators, you're gonna book a fucking top-tier musical act? And I understand that frustration. That'd be like if I announced company-wide, like, hey, we're all gonna have to tighten our belts, salaries are gonna have to go down, but very excited to talk about the game plan for the upcoming year on my yacht. And guess what? BTS is performing. You'd be like, fuck you. How about you help me pay my rent? And for these Twitch streamers, it's like, so you're taking my ability to reinvest into the content that I'm making so that you can just fuck around with Meg. Or to get more specific tweets like, so Twitch can't afford to pay their creators 70-30, can't fix their media player that crashes after each ad, can't enforce their policies so people aren't doing inappropriate things on stream, but they can't afford paying celebrities to promote their streaming site. So, you know, kind of going over like a, a turd a punch bowl. But I will say it's going to be very interesting to see like how things move from here. YouTube's been snatching up more and more talent. And while YouTube's not perfect, it seems like more and more people are pissed off at Twitch every day. And currently, it remains to be seen if Twitch is going to be able to write this ship, make it so that this is a successful company, not just right now, but for 5, 10, 20 years from now. Or will their long lasting legacy be uh, it was a great service if you wanted to eventually get signed by YouTube and get fucking crazy money? Because that seems like one of the best ways to make money on YouTube. Start on Twitch. And then I want to thank the sponsor of today's show, Cuts Clothing. I can just not understate how comfortable everything I have from Cuts Clothing is. It is now literally half my wardrobe. I love it. And they're perfect for back to office school, just post summer life, whatever you want. They are buttery soft, wrinkle resistant, pre-shrunk shirts. And most importantly, they retain shape over time. I must've washed my tees 50 plus and they still look new. And Cuts lets you choose your perfect cut with options of a split hem, elongated, or the classic curve hem, which is my personal favorite. I love how it looks on my body and I know you do too, you pervert. I see you, I. I mean, my eyes are up here. Y'all, Cuts is my no-brainer go-to for clothes. Comfortable, versatile, perfect for the changing seasons. And Cuts offers the highest quality work leisure products that can be styled day to night, casual to formal. The long sleeve Henleys elevate your look for out to dinner or polished look in the office. But you're still just wearing your favorite t-shirt of all time. If you just buy one of them, you will see what I mean. And or, Cuts makes a phenomenal gift to any man or woman in your life. You just can't go wrong with their pieces no matter the season. So click that link down below and use code PhillyD to get 15% off your first order today. And then Arizona could literally decide the fate of this country. Whereas the classic battleground that Biden very narrowly flipped back in 2020 and where Trump and his allies have fought bitterly to overturn the election results. And since then, the Republicans in control at the state level, they've imposed some of the most outrageous voter suppression laws and redistricting after the 2020 census ultimately resulted in one more Republican leaning seat and one less Democratic leaning one. So with Arizona, it's one of the most key states for Republicans to gain seats, to close a narrow gap in the House and take the majority. But if the 2020 election has taught us anything, it's to not not count your Arizona voters before they've hatched or I voted. Yeah, voted. That's also in part because despite losing a Democratic leaning seat, Arizona is still home to some of the most competitive races in the country, with one of the most important being Arizona's first district, which also just so you know, everything's changed with redistricting and District 1 covers areas previously considered District 6. And according to the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, redistricting made the map several points better for Democrats in AZ01, and it's now a district that went for Biden and every statewide Democrat would have won since 2018. So as a result, the Republican incumbent, Representative David Schweikert, is currently locked in a race for his life against his Democratic opponent, business executive, and community leader, Jevin Hodge, with the most recent polling showing the two in a dead heat, tied at 47% and 6% undecided. And so as part of my effort this year to talk to candidates in these essential close races, I reached out to Hodge, and he told us exactly why Schweikert is a bad choice for voters. I mean, what it really comes down to is you have someone with David Schweikert uh, that has been convicted of 11 ethical violations, right? And everything, including uh, campaign fraudulent loans, first class travel, Super Bowl tickets, uh, and the list goes on and on and on. And so at, at the, the, the basis here, you have someone that you just can't simply trust uh, in leadership. 
not to mention a voting record that is fully anti-American, has voted against every initiative that would deliver for Arizona families uh, and would deliver for the American people. The American Rescue Act, the bipartisan infrastructure package, protecting our troops, marriage equality, um, the gun safety bill, inflation reduction. I mean, I can just keep going on and on and on. And then uh, he backs up his uh, his actions with his words. Um, he's on record saying that climate change is folklore. A woman does not need the right to choose, and that the people of January six is kind hearted, well intentioned people. And w- what this means is, right? You have somebody who voted to overturn the election, does not believe in the the principles that uniquely makes America America. Uh, and, and you have someone that is actively working against the will of the American people. But also with Hodge, I said, you know, I really just want to know the two things. Why not him, but why you? And also asking him how he would respond to the criticism that he isn't qualified because he's so young and he hasn't held public office. My story uh, is is that of the American people. It's not much different. And I'm a business executive. I get to work with mission tripping organizations every single day. Uh, that that delivers for uh, the communities in which they operate in. I'm a unifier. I bring people together. And then I'm a Head Start uh, executive as well. I'm the president of the longest running Head Start, the Booker T. Washington Child Development Center. We are serving families across the Phoenix metro area, delivering service and doing everything that we possibly can to help folks get ahead. I was also interested to know like, what actually mattered to the people in this district? Because when, when we talk about the elections, we usually think about everything on a national level. Because yeah, while a lot of the national issues are local issues, you are representing this specific group and you're supposed to be doing the best for them. I'm not going to Washington to be uh, a federal official. I'm not. I'm not that guy. I'm going to Washington to be a local official that has access to federal resources and that will act in the interest of my community at the federal level. And right now, when you talk about the number one, number two, number three issues, Arizonans are hurting. The economy's hitting us hard here. Uh, And we need leaders that are going to provide realistic solutions that's going to attract innovative economic solutions, inspire economic innovation so that we can cultivate homegrown individuals, provide those high wage jobs. But in in addition to that, folks need to see you know, everyday impact as well. We need to lower costs for families. So you, you look at um, right now, we can lower the cost of prescription drugs. Schweikert has voted no to cap insulin uh, at $35 a bottle. In addition to that, um, they're, they're afraid that their freedoms are under attack. You look at all of the attacks right now on democracy. We need to strengthen, you know, you look at the, the HR1, the For the People Act, and the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. When we strengthen the, the, the fundamentals of our democracy, ensure that Pete, we're expanding access to the ballot box, we're going to have uh, more rep- participation, which is going to increase, you know, representation here in the United States Congress. And not to mention, reproductive freedoms. I'm going to be someone in the United States Congress that's going to fight every single day to ensure that anybody has the right to choose what they so want to with their bodies. And that includes the the freedom to get an abortion. But also with all that, we can't lose sight of the fact that yes, this is still something that affects everybody. This isn't a race that just affects District 1. This could very well decide the future of this country. Right now, we we have people that are roaming the halls of Congress that are actively working to tear down what we all collectively have worked so hard to protect and preserve. We need to protect the future of our democracy in order to have a republic to live in, to pass on to our kids and our grandkids. Uh, And that starts by weeding out the bad apples. David Schweikert is one of them. I'm working to, 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 to take care of this race so that we can have people that are willing to unite and work across lines. I, I'm Barack Obama Democrat. I consider myself a McCain Obama. I'm an Arizonan, right? I, I, I'm, I'm someone that's right in the middle here that's going to be able to work with folks on both sides of the aisle, understands perspectives, and are, are willing to find real solutions. Is there a last thing that you'd like to, to leave me and my audience with, especially since just even one vote from the people that are watching could change Mm -hmm. the race if I want to make this an all-important interview. When you think about everything that is happening right now uh, in the halls of Congress, right? you you look at the laws that are being passed and you look at the folks that are fighting against good initiatives for uh, the American people. I'm going to close out with this. If you want to change the laws, you have to change the lawmakers. 
And so we need people that are going to be willing to, like I said, roll up their sleeves, get down and do the work to deliver for every American and to deliver for every Arizonan. And I'm going to be that person to do so. And then I want to take a second to thank the fantastic sponsor of today's show, Brilliant. They're making today's show possible. And Brilliant takes subjects like math, science, computer science, you know, those areas of life that people fear most and convert them into awesome experiences of guided discovery. With thousands of lessons and exclusive new content added monthly, Brilliant offers courses for all levels, from mathematical fundamentals to quantitative finance and so much more. And it's suited for ages 10 to 110. And for those out of school, I realize this, if you don't use that you're gonna lose it. And Brilliant is great for students, professionals, and really anyone who just wants to get better at things. It's important to remain sharp at any age of life, and Brilliant makes it fun and easy. What I really love about Brilliant is the interactive lessons. It's just a much more fun way of learning as you apply math and science to daily problem solving or challenge yourself to level up in areas that benefit your growth in your current position or just life itself. Basically, I think we all need to work our brains no matter what age or stage in life, so don't miss out on this great offer. Go to brilliant.org slash DeFranco to sign up for free. And the first 200 of you beautiful bastards will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium premium subscription. And then, what do you like? That is an important question in life for yourself, for those around you, for companies trying to drain you of every single dollar you're worth. And that's why this recent Axios poll that surveyed adults about their favorite corporate brands was so interesting to me, where they broke down the data to find the favorite brands of different age groups. And I found things like, big surprise, Gen Z adults heavily favor tech and social media brands. And when it comes to the newer favorites, you have things like Discord, Snapchat, TikTok, and Shein, the shopping app. And notably here, we saw some pretty big gaps in what Gen Z is consuming compared to the whole of US adults. With Gen Z's big four being YouTube, Google, Netflix, and Amazon, and YouTube being actually their most liked brand. But the real key here to why Axios looked at what Gen Z was consuming is because, as they know, people ages 18 to 25 have increasing societal clout and spending power, but their tastes don't always conform to those of their elders. Which brings to mind this moment of Mr. Beast on the Flagrant podcast where he's talking about where companies are spending ad dollars. It's weird how slow it is. They still would rather, like, buy a Orange Bowl commercial <laughs> than, than a YouTube yeah. video. And it's like, how many people are even watching this football game? I don't know. You know, like, well, I mean, it's probably like four or five million, but. Is it? Probably, yeah. It's like every old person home, they just leave the TV on That's, the well, and, and they're opening up TikTok and commercials. I agree, like, yeah. you know, it's low. That's what I'm saying. On commercials, on TV, they're like, okay, go ahead and pick up your phone right now. Go open TikTok. We'll yeah. see you in two minutes. We're gonna bore the shit out of you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But you know, and on YouTube, that's what you get. So it's like it's more eyeballs, and it's like the person you're there watching. And even with Mr. Bees being one of the most successful people online, you don't have to just take him at his word. Market analysts also agree with him. With, for example, one saying, brands can't just exist as brands anymore. They have to have an interface, something for audiences to actually engage with. Those companies need to be more approachable and more personable because audiences are growing very used to being able to interact with the creators that they like. And, you know, we have seen more and more old school companies staples out there. They're engaging in new advertising strategies. McDonald's, I think, is a fantastic example of that. They had that insanely viral Travis Scott meal a couple years back there. There was even then Travis Scott launching a clothing line around it. McDonald's also working with the likes of BTS, and now they had an adult happy meal to bank on nostalgia. Also, as we've talked about before, massive toy companies are moving their advertising from traditional outlets to YouTube and TikTok. And some, it's like not even thought of as a split, even going as far as to cut out television altogether, with the president and CEO of Canal Toys saying last year, my budget for TV this year is zero. Last year, I only used influencers and this year only influencers, and I don't see myself going back. And according to an influencer marketing agency, around $9.7 billion was spent on influencer marketing in 2020, and more than $15 billion is expected to be spent in 2022. And they go on to say, with more social media platforms scaling and setting the cultural agenda, such as TikTok, creators are emerging as the key gateway between consumers and brands. Which is also why I think in addition to creators and these massive companies having partnerships, we're gonna see more and more creators having their own massive companies. And personally, I welcome it. I get to support creators I like. It does feel more engaging. I mean, my son and I, one of our favorite things is Mark Rover's Crunch Labs. And I think if anything, and this might just be like in the in the in these transitionary years, the only thing that might make a, a Rover need a larger company is the ability to put out as much as he wants. Like I got in on Crunch Labs day one. They're currently sold out. You have to join a fucking wait list in hopes that you can start getting boxes. That is how successful shit like this is. Also, since I'm just shouting people out, if you want a good knife, get the Babish knife. He has a whole bunch of cookware. It's fantastic. He's not even my friend. I mean, maybe we're friendly. In my experience, this shit's just been good. And then at the risk of sounding ageist, I put pose the question, should there be an age limit if you want to be a politician? That's been a long-standing question when talking about Congress or even the White House, and one that has kind of been rekindled thanks to this clip going viral of President Biden publicly asking if a congresswoman who died last month was present at a current White House event. The lawmaker in question was Republican Representative Jackie Walorski, who had helped convene and organize the White House Conference on Food, Nutrition, and Health that Biden was speaking at. In fact, Biden had even acknowledged her work on the conference in an official White House statement following her death last month, which read, Jill 
Jill and I are shocked and saddened by the death of Congresswoman Jackie Walorski of Indiana, along with two members of her staff in a car accident today in Indiana. And continuing, I appreciated her partnership as we plan for a historic White House conference on hunger, nutrition, and health this fall that will be marked by her deep care for the needs of rural America. But in his remarks yesterday, thanking the group of bipartisan lawmakers who helped make this event happen, we saw this. I want to thank all of you here for including bipartisan elected officials like Representative Governor, Senator Braun, Senator Booker, Representative Jackie, are you here? Where's Jackie? I didn't think she was, she was going to be here. Now, Biden, for his part, did not correct the mistake during the speech, but in a press conference later, the White House press secretary repeatedly said that the congresswoman was top of mind for Biden because he was championing the lawmakers who had worked on the conference, as well as because he's set to meet with her family on Friday when he's scheduled to sign a bill in her honor. Though, to be honest, the fact that he's supposed to sign a bill in her honor two days from when he made those remarks makes it kind of look worse. And so with all this, you had a lot of people in media outlets using this as evidence that Biden, who is 79, does not have the mental capacity to serve as president, with many saying the president is senile. And while, yeah, unsurprisingly, most of those remarks came from the right, which has regularly questioned his mental acuity, I think this is an issue that goes beyond left and right. It goes beyond Biden and touches on concerns about America's most important leaders being old. Right? Because while Biden is the oldest president in history, Trump, who is 76, would have also held that title if he had won his re-election. And his mental state has, of course, been heavily questioned as well. But also, very importantly, it goes beyond the presidency. The current session of Congress is the oldest on average of any Congress in recent history. And this is a bipartisan problem. The averages are fairly similar when it comes to Republicans and Democrats. But there's also a higher percentage of people who are older than the median age, right? Nearly one out of every four members are over the age of 70. And very importantly, some of the people in the highest leadership positions are among the oldest members, right? Nancy Pelosi is the oldest ever House Speaker at 82 years old. The third person in line for the presidency is the same age. And Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell is 257 years old, which is why it's unsurprising that a recent Insider Morning Consult poll found that three in four Americans support an age limit for members of Congress. And more than 40% say that they view the ages of political leaders as a major problem. And it makes sense. Like I said, I, at risk of sounding ageist, there are tons of other industries that have age caps, like airline pilots, the military. And if you're too old to fly a plane, you're probably too old to be making laws that are going to impact the entire country, especially a country that isn't at all demographically represented by age in Congress. But with that, of course, imposing age limits on Congress or the presidency would almost certainly require changes to the Constitution. And unfortunately, those changes would have to be made by the same ancient ones who currently refuse to let power slip from their arthritic grip. And so with that, that's a story. You can obviously tell where I stand, but I want to pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts here? Do you think there should be age limits for Congress and the presidency? And if so, what should that limit be? And then World War III. Is it about to happen? Will the video games about it afterwards be cool? Those are just two questions in the air following Putin's government ramping up its nuclear rhetoric after annexing four more regions of Ukraine after a sham referendum and what looks to be sabotage on the Nord Stream pipeline. So starting with the pipeline, it connects Russian gas to places like Germany through the Baltic Sea and was heavily damaged in multiple spots a few days ago, pouring tons of natural gas into the ocean. And while blame has gone around people pointing fingers, there is no doubt that it was deliberately damaged. It is not officially known who damaged the pipeline, but European countries are already hinting that they think that it was Russia's attempt to attack their energy infrastructures. With Denmark's defense minister saying that Russia has a significant military presence in the Baltic region and we expect them to continue their saber rattling. Also NATO's general secretary warning against future attacks and tweeting, any deliberate attack against allies' critical infrastructure would be met with a united and determined response. However, Russia has denied wrongdoing here and described such claims as predictably stupid with a spokesperson saying the country had no interest in damaging the pipeline due to how valuable the natural gas was. And adding that this area is is the Baltic Sea. There were many more aircraft, ships, or other marine vehicles from NATO countries there, and arguing that these reports of Russia's involvement are absolutely ridiculous and biased. But they did say they had a likely culprit in mind. That's right, we did it. It was America all along. With a spokesperson supposed evidence for this being an offhand comment that Biden made back in February that there would, quote, be no longer a Nord Stream 2 pipeline if Russia invaded Ukraine. Though with that, American officials scoffed at the theory and called it preposterous. So you had all that, and obviously we need to care about what develops there, but we should also move on to how Russia is using sham referendums in Ukraine to justify annexing four more regions of the country and escalating the chance of nuclear war. So earlier this week, when Russian authorities in both the breakaway regions of Ukraine, alongside other occupied territories, held referendums on joining Russia, would you believe it? Just landslides. 87 and 99% of the people saying they wanted to join Russia, which by the way, at least make it believable. I don't know 90% of people that agree on anything. But that aside, we didn't have to wait long to see how fast Putin would move here, but they're now being 
elevating expectations that Putin's going to give a speech tomorrow to formally annex them. And this territory would amount to 15% of Ukraine's territory. Now, with all of this, Ukraine has called these referendums illegal with its foreign ministry saying that forcing people in these territories to fill out some papers at the barrel of a gun is yet another Russian crime in the course of its aggression against Ukraine. With President Zelensky saying in a statement that the votes are worthless and do not change reality, the territorial integrity of Ukraine will be restored and our reaction to recognition of the results by Russia will be very harsh. And internationally, all of this has been condemned as illegal, with some places like Finland using it as a nail in the coffin to finally ban Russians with tourist visas, which could have a huge impact for a number of reasons, including many Russians are actually using them to escape the draft right now. Also, what's especially worrying about these moves is how it escalates the chance of nuclear weapons being used. Russia has long made it clear that if there was an attack on Russia that threatened the stability of the country, it has the right to use nuclear weapons to defend itself. And so now, Putin and Russia, they're changing what Russia is. With Russia saying, hey, that's ours now, all of a sudden Ukraine's invading Russia. When in reality, all they'd be doing are kicking out the occupiers, the invading force. And this is on top of everything getting more deadly by the day. Right? We're very likely to see the death tolls heavily rise in this war as untrained Russian conscripts are now starting to get to the front. And even when the fighting mostly stops in the winter, it's expected that many are just going to freeze to death due to a lack of equipment. And as much as people want Russia to lose this war, like I don't get giddy thinking about some fucking guy who's just been fed misinformation for years and years and years who Putin forces to the front line dying or freezing to death. Or like, I stand with the people of Ukraine. I want them to slap Putin right in his dumb fucking face. But it's also important to remember there are victims of all kinds in this situation. Once again, I really don't see an end to Putin throwing his people into the wood chipper and, and really just threatening everybody's existence in the world right now unless someone close to him does something about it. Give him some of that special Russian tea and let's be done with it. But ultimately, that is where that story on today's show ends. As always, thank you for watching and being subscribed to my daily dives into the news. If you're not already, how dare you do it now? Also, if you want to help support the show, you can go to beautifulbastard.com, snag yourself a shirt or a poster. But with that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow. It'll be a YouTube short, but it's still technically me seeing you tomorrow.